Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, the foreign editor of The Australian, Greg Sheridan, whose latest book, When We're Young and Foolish, recalls his student days with Tony Abbott and other future politicians. Modern Greek scholar and author, Vrasidas Karalis, the co-deputy leader of the Greens, Larissa Waters, shadow immigration minister, Richard Miles, and from the Centre for Independent Studies, Tricia Jar. Please welcome our panel. And just a quick note before we start, for those who uh, haven't heard the news, Agriculture Minister Barnaby Joyce, who was going to be on tonight's panel, was instructed to withdraw from Q&A by the Prime Minister last night. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, so let's go to our very first question. It's from Jack Lattimore. In the lead-up to the referendum in Greece this week, polling showed a tight result was likely. However, the no vote won in a landslide. Why did the Greeks trust Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras on this matter in spite of a possible withdrawal from the Eurozone? And what impact will this have on the integrity of the European Union in general? Rosidas, let's start with you. You've only just come back from Greece, as a matter of fact. Yes, last, last Wednesday. Well, there is only one word for this, and that's Greek, of course. It's drama. More drama and drama again and again. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a country and a society that thrives on dramatic juxtapositions and contrasts. And close to drama, there's comedy and tragedy, as you know, parts of the drama. You know, just, it depends where you start from. Uh, I believe that that happened because um, um, Tsipras, the Syriza government, wanted to win the emotional aspect of this uh, referendum. They wanted to show, give a powerful message to the Europeans that we have suffered enough. We have uh, uh, had enough of this austerity, which hasn't essentially delivered anything that promised in the, in the beginning that's going to take place after five years. And actually, the people have become uh, poorer. They have lost a sense of dignity. They have lost a sense of pride that they used to have until now. So people said enough is enough. So it was a political issue mixed with a lot of populism, mixed a lot of emotions, mixed a lot with uh, real issues as well. And that's why the no vote, the OHI, we must not forget the word OHI, which has such emotional investment by the people because that was the word that the Greeks used during the Second World War against the uh, Axis powers, Italy and Germany. So it has become a, uh, it became a, a powerful tool to win this uh, referendum. That's true, but you were um, <laughs> profoundly against the no vote. Tell us why. Oh, not profoundly, not profoundly, mildly. Mildly? Mildly, <laughs> mildly. yeah, mildly. It's very good. I you know, misread just... your blog. Probably, yeah, 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 probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, mildly against, but because, you know, it's 50-50 always. The problem with this, with both sides of the re referendum is that both of them had 90, were 90% 90 right. And both of them were 10% wrong. And that part that they were wrong could have become the common ground that they will come together, discuss the problems, find a commonly accepted proposal for the referendum and for the Europeans to the, towards the European uh, institutions, which happens only today. Mm. Well, the Prime Minister Tsipras says the no vote doesn't mean there'll be a rupture with Europe. Do you think he's right? I think so. It's impossible for the rupture to take place. That will rupture not simply the relations between Greece and the European Union, but they will have a... a I would say, in the long run, a domino effect amongst the European uh, Union member states. Because there are many problems, the way that the European Union was established in the first place, and now with the Greek case, that came to the fore, became very pronounced, and became, some, in some way, the uh, uh, flag for a new uh, orientation within the European Union. From my perception, the victory of no in this uh, referendum was the victory of politics over economics. Mm. Well, let's go to our second question on the same subject, and I'll bring in the other panellists from Kyle Miners. Uh, is it fair to the European Union for the Greek government to encourage a no vote? So why should they be allowed to kind of mismanage their economy and then try and minimise the consequences? Greg Sheridan. Well, um, you know, that's a fair question, and I benefit from Brass's... Uh, good analysis, but I think this tragedy for Greece is actually represents a catastrophic failure for the European Union. Because one of two things can happen now. Either the European Union backs down on everything it said and gives Greek a special deal where it forgives a whole lot of debt, 
Maybe that's the right thing to do, but it contradicts everything that the Europeans have been saying until now. Or it forces Greek, Greece out of the Eurozone. And the way it designed the Eurozone, as, as Vras said, was full of flaws. And the worst flaw was the completely undemocratic proposition that you can never leave. As William Hague said, it's a house on fire with no exit. So they have no idea how Greece could leave the Eurozone and revert to a drachma, which might be a good thing to do, but because the European bureaucrats have always said you can never leave and the purpose of human existence is ever deeper European Union and bugger national democracies, they're totally unprepared for that. But if they give in now to this government, there'll be a contagion effect throughout the rest of Europe on that score, everyone will say, well, you can be totally irresponsible and the European Union uh, institutions have to surrender to you. So I think this is a colossal failure for Europe. Let's hear from uh, Tricia Jarre on the other end of the panel. Yeah, to the extent that the European Union is a worthwhile project, and I think it is, I think what Greg was saying about the fact that you know, this can go one of two ways, and I think either way, it's especially if we go <laughs> for the option that... Um, the, they come up with some kind of compromise. At the end of the day, I suppose the taxpayers of the rest of the European Union are going to feel resentful. And I think that, to the extent that it has a flow-on effect to uh, national uh, member state politics, so the rise of Eurosceptic parties, uh, we saw a 12% vote for UKIP um, in the United Kingdom elections, other... European member states have had similar results. I think if that damages faith in the European project more generally, then I think that could be a problem. Richard Miles, is this a kind of um, a copybook example of what can happen when debt gets too big in any country? Well, uh, I, I suppose it may be. I mean, I think looking at this from where we sit now, um, it, it seems very hard as to how some kind of an agreement is going to be reached uh, in relation to Greece's uh, continuation within the Eurozone. Um, certainly, though, I would have thought from, our, from, from an Australian interest point of view, sanity lies on the road to some kind of agreement being reached. There is absolutely no doubt from an Australian interest point of view of the value of the European project. project. Uh, I mean... The European Union has delivered stability and security in, in Europe over a long period of time, but it's also... I mean, the EU, we shouldn't forget, is our largest trading partner, if you take it as one entity. So uh, this is not unimportant for us. Um, not, of course, to mention the fact that we have a large Greek community here who would obviously be uh, experiencing this in terms of the experience of their relatives back in Greece. But uh, seems to be a very... I mean, it's very hard to... How you reconcile the rhetoric of the referendum that we've just seen over the weekend with what one imagines needs to be now done in terms of reaching an agreement. I'll just quickly go back to uh, Russ. Now, you've been getting emails from hundreds, by the sound of it, of uh, Greek professionals trying to get out of the country. I mean, are they going to experience some terrible brain drain? Well, that's, I think, the main, the most tragic and detrimental consequence of this crisis. That the best, the most creative, the most dynamic people have already abandoned the country. They've gone mo mostly to Germany, England, uh, Canada, the United States, and some of them, because of the citizenship problem that we have here, can come, but they have made it here because some of the parents were here in the 60s and, and 70s, and they went back to Greece in the 80s and 90s, and now they are repatriated back to Australia. So I think that's the worst aspect, the humanitarian aspect, a crisis of, uh, in, in Greece. But meanwhile, I believe that most of them have a sense of uh, this is not going to be permanent, because most of them grew up in the country, know the political and social system. They've been shaped by the political institutions and the social uh, behaviours, patterns of protocol that we have in that country. And I, th I think that they want their dreams to go back. And I think this crisis will end soon, I think. And I don't think there will be a long lasting crisis. There's a, an, a, an absolute determination by both the Greek government and the European institutions to solve this problem as soon as possible. And, and just very briefly on that subject, because we heard about the potential for contagion from uh, yeah. two of our guests. If it's not solved, and uh, for example, we see problems right now in China, what, are the, what is the potential for the contagion spreading globally? 
I think will be uh, quite likely, a high probability of that. But I think that what we have the opportunity to do now through the Greek case, the problems and the crisis that we have in Greece, is to reimagine the European project to see what sort of problems we have so far, what sort of structural questions have impacted on the Greek case in this uh, instance, and re-plan the whole thing, redesign the whole of the, the uh, function of the European Union, especially in its monetary union, its monetary aspect. Because the European Union, as a political institution, has worked perfectly, has done some miracles, especially in the human rights uh, front. It has solved many crises within the continent. It has a very beneficial impact on the social problems that they are looming throughout, especially the poorer areas of Europe. They have some of the most revolutionary social policies that we have seen within the capitalist system we, are in, uh, we live in at the moment. And I think we the have... Because they just can't afford those policies. <coughs> I, if I may say, I don't think so. It's a matter of management. Because before the gentleman said, uh, the con uh, used the uh, idea of mismanagement, I don't think that's simply a question of mismanagement. It's the way that the European Union itself has been designed mm. to, be, to have problems of how you use the money that somebody's giving you. OK, I'm going to interrupt you uh, because I, I want to hear uh, one last question on the subject from Nina Rossi. And uh, we'll bring in Larissa Waters after that. Thank you. Hi there. Um, the Greek no vote displays a real desire for change in how the governments act on behalf of their people. <laughs> Doesn't this situation highlight a systemic problem in the status quo of finance and governments where both parties are more concerned with the spreadsheet than the interests of real people who otherwise cannot live in this situation? Larissa Waters. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Nina, um, and to the other two questioners as well. Uh, I think the uh, resounding result of the referendum over the weekend is a good stance for democracy. And I, like many of the other panellists, I find it hard to believe that a Eurozone could continue without Greece, it being the, the original home of democracy, the, the genesis of it. Um, but I guess we look to the economic lessons that it's showed us, and I uh, believe that the Greek economy is contracted by about 25% under austerity measures. And the lesson that I take from that for Australia, which is salient to the current government, is you can't cut your way to prosperity. And we've seen incredibly harsh budget measures in last year's budget that were locked in in this year's budget. And uh, a whole lot of fewer about a budget crisis that we were told we had and now all of a sudden we're told we don't have any more. Um, I think you're right in saying that politics rules the day rather than the concerns and the sensitivities and the awareness about the needs of actual people in the community. And that, that as uh, politicians, is our job to represent those people. So I think you've hit the nail on the head there and we need to remember that these are the people that we make decisions for. So very briefly, you think the referendum was a good thing in spite of the risks? Well, I, I find it hard to believe that they won't find a way through. I... I, I I hope that there's a compromise arrangement reached. Um, it would be destabilising for the Eurozone to, to, to kick Greece out. So I can't imagine that will happen. I don't have all of the answers and hopefully they will be um, underway soon. Um, but this is a win for democracy and I think that um, the Greek people deserve a chance at a prosperous economy that puts people at the centre of their needs. I'll just go back to uh, Tricia. A win for democracy, do you think? Oh, I don't really know about that. I think I, one of the things that I picked up on in your question, Nina, is I think you, you kind of juxtapose, juxtaposed people and, and finance, whereas I, I think that's a bit of a false dichotomy. I mean, my people have jobs, they pay taxes, they have economic lives that are not so separate from the idea of, a, of an economy and a financial system more broadly. So I think that to say somehow that we can consider the needs of the people without considering of their needs as taxpayers, as, as workers, as people who want to support their families and, you know, grow and build businesses, I, I think that's a bit of a false dichotomy. Yeah, Russ, can I bring you back in here? Um, I mentioned you were in Greece last week and you, in the end, you left uh, a fair bit of cash for your mother, who's a pensioner. Um, that's very significant because, in fact, Greece could run out, their banks could literally run out of cash sometime soon. As from tonight, I think. Tonight. According to the latest, you know, Monday night in uh, European uh, time. I think that so, what, so what happens when, when the banks run out of cash? 
It's a very interesting social experiment, as you understand. <laughs> <laughs> I know what happens when I run out of cash. I, yeah. where, where, I think they can survive. I think that is no problem. I think most of the Greeks and most of the um, economies that they were so abruptly or uh, even violently uh, modernized or post modernized have a lot of money uh, uh, under the mattress <laughs> or in, under the, uh, the pillow. So there's a lot of cash flowing around. So the, Euro the European, you think the European bank will essentially re or cash up those banks, send them huge piles of money. They've done that in the past. Well, if there will be an agreement, mm. I call the agreement the reconciliation between <laughs> Greece and Europe. I think it will be inevitable that they will d do the same as they did in 2012 when we had a, serious, a, sim a similar problem. It's a matter of political will, and I think the referendum showed beyond any doubt that citizens are back. They have to take their destiny into their own hands, and they gave that powerful message to Europe. I don't... The European Union was established through the dreams and the visions of great political leaders like Monet, like De Gaulle, like Mitterrand, like Kohl, like Adenauer, and that was a European Union of citizens, not of accountants. I think, really, there's an air of unreality about this discussion. I mean, the bottom line is, Greece, which is a wonderful country full of fabulous people, spent much more than it earned for a very long period of time. And the way it financed its recurrent social spending was by borrowing money. And now it says it doesn't want to pay the money back. Now, if you agree with that and you say, OK, we're going to forgive all the debt, well, that means everybody else who has debt doesn't want to pay it back. And far from the European Union working perfectly, you've got a model in a continent in terrible crisis with unsolvable uh, 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 demographic problems, unsolvable budgetary problems, massive unemployment, not only in Greece but across southern Europe, massive youth unemployment, massive immigration, massive social alienation. If this works... Per I tell you what, as someone who spends most of my life in Asia, there's not one single person in Asia who says... By golly, I wish we had the European Union here. Mm. But, uh, Greg, just a, a quick question. Do you think austerity works? Um, because here's a country brought to its knees uh, by the policies meant to fix up the problem. Yeah, and this austerity program is a very poorly designed program. But part of the problem with the European Union is it discourages countries from taking responsibility for their own situation. If you as a nation don't have a European Union and you have to design your own austerity program, you design it smart to boost productivity, to make your economy competitive, you devalue your currency, you get tourism in and all of that. But if it's imposed on you by an outside body, which you really secretly hope will always pay the bills, you get very, very ineffective... And I agree this has been very bad policy, but I think the problem has been the European Union, not the solution. Russ, I'll give you the final word on this because um, it appears that there's a split emerging in the EU uh, between the Latin countries, many of whom, like Greece, are in serious debt, and the Germanic countries, Austria, Germany, uh, others, Holland, um, who think they should be able to impose serious economic restrictions on the economies of those debtors. This is a fundamental split in the EU itself. Well, I think that this is the problem with the so-called austerity, because the austerity was doomed from the beginning to fail. And the union itself was made on the basis of solidarity and mutual aid. I mean, that was the purpose that we cr the union was created in the first place. Mm. Unfortunately, as you see, there were successive governments, both, both in Greece, in, in Greece, in Italy, in Spain, in Ireland, in many other countries, even very high, heavily industrialised countries like Finland, where have enormous debts, still manage the, they have to manage their way in a sustainable and viable way. The debts that were actually, if I may say, Greece was almost forced to, to have were due, first of all, to the Olympic Games as well. We must not forget the 2004 Olympic Games over budgeted three times than it used to be, it had to be. They were 7 billion uh, euros and then when were around 20 billion euros. So there was a problem, an endemic problem in Greece of this, of this kind. I think what we needed in Greece was a more rational discussion through the referendum of how this uh, um, uh, situation of being addicted to getting debts could be solved. And I think now, I mean, this referendum and probably, if I may say, this new government want to address this issue.
They want to solve this issue forever, and I think there is a renewed determination from the European <coughs> institutions as well to have and, a, a and permanent solution. A final, a final one here, because the Australian um, Greek finance minister has resigned. Um, was that inevitable? Did he have to resign in order for there to be actual negotiations with the uh, European Union again? Well, I think what he did is that he personalised this battle with the Europeans, the war with the European institutions. Uh, Yanis Varoufakis had in enormously uh, visionary and creative ideas, but some of them, and some very crucial ideas there, were totally unrealistic and unrealizable. And this is what politics are about, is the, po the, the art of the feasible, what is possible to happen under the circumstances we are at the moment. So he had to go, in other words, so that Europeans would have someone to negotiate with who had a pragmatic frame of mind. Well, um, I think so, because it became a personal issue at the end, because of his style. Don't forget that academics like me like lecturing. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and we are, you know, just we don't want to stop lecturing. I'm going so to stop I, you in a moment, Stop though. me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that was the problem with Yanis, but, oh, Mr Varoufakis, but I think he had some very good ideas. If some of them were implemented immediately after they came to power, they would have become very successful, but unfor unfortunately, tactically, they spent a lot of money in negotiating these ideas. So the ideas essentially dissipated into rhetoric and, uh, you know, if I may say, future plans that will happen after we have a new agreement. All right. Um, we'll have to uh, move along to other subjects because we have quite a few. You're watching Q&A. It's live. It's unpredictable. The next question comes from George Knott. Is democracy in danger when politicians avoid facing questions from citizens in public forums such as this? Greg Sheridan. Well, look, I, I, <laughs> let, me, let me exercise my sort of seer-like quality. I suspect you're making a reference to Barnaby Joyce uh, uh, and declining to come. Look, um, I think I'd just say two things about that. One is, Tony, it's a fantastic opportunity for you to explore the magnificent talent on the coalition backbench now and, and a lot of backbenchers a lot of backbenchers that you used to have on this show um josh frydenberg and um uh, kelly yeah, o'dwyer yeah, yeah. you know won great promotion yeah, by know. coming on your show but look the other point i i do think the government is mistaken not to come on this show i do think it's mistaken i'd say if i can analyze this tony crudely as if you're not here the politics of it were the abc made a mistake with zaki muller and everyone recognizes that dear god i'd hate to be you know absolutely condemned for every mistake I've made in 40 <laughs> years of journalism. But the government is now in danger of making the sympathy flow against it, making itself the issue. All it needed to do was say, you've been very naughty, the ABC, and we're very disappointed in you, and let community sentiment express itself and move on. So I think it's a pity, and I was looking forward to seeing Barnaby here tonight, but I'm... I'm consoled by having Richard here instead. <laughs> <laughs> Richard was going to be here anyway. He's going to be here anyway. Larissa uh, Waters will and be Larissa here. And Larissa too, of course. Thanks, Greg. Um, great question, George. And I think it's a real shame that we don't have government front benches or back benches here to face your questions as they should in a robust democracy. Um, it's been a huge overreaction, in my view, by the Abbott government and by the Prime Minister in particular to the, the show two weeks ago. Um, He's flogging a dead horse two weeks on and he's now issuing a decree that his front benches aren't allowed to come on a show. Um, I, clearly he's wanting to distract from talking about other issues and what a shame we don't have Barnaby on tonight. We could have asked him about his agricultural white paper and the fact that it continues to completely ignore climate change or the fact that he seems to think that um, marriage equality is somehow decadent. I would have liked to have um, heard his responses to the questions people would have no doubt, no doubt asked about that. Um, but I think the Abbott government is attacking um, the ABC because it doesn't like the ABC. Mm. We've seen the funding for the mm. ABC generally uh, slashed by this government. Um, we know that this government doesn't like uh, transparency and it likes to... Um, silence those who try to criticise it. You've seen the withdrawal of funding from all sorts of community groups and environment groups who have spoken out against the um, attacks that this government has wrought on various areas of social policy and environmental policy. I think this is just yet another example of the Abbott government not liking criticism and wanting to silence the public broadcaster for being independent rather than for somehow being a champion for the Abbott government's regime. OK, let's go to uh, Tricia Jha. Tricia. Um, so one of the things I've noticed in the two years or so that this government has existed is that they don't seem to be very good at prosecuting their 
political messages. And I think one of the key ways to do that is to actually get out into a forum such as Q&A where you can have a discussion about you know, all sorts of various topics that might not necessarily be related to your portfolio area. As someone who is right of centre and likes to prosecute arguments based on right of centre, on liberal, small l liberal ideas, I think that you have to be in it to win it. That's the only way that that anything is going to change if that's if the government wants to actually govern with conservative or, or with liberal values, then front benches or back benches for that matter have to be able to get out and participate, basically. Richard Miles, um, I do recall um, in the Gillard government we did have an empty chair here one evening. Um, so it's not exactly um, only um, coalition governments who are guilty of this sort of thing. Well, I was looking forward to the uh, empty chair here tonight and uh, I think at that point Malcolm Turnbull uh, referenced the sock puppet and I was uh, wondering whether or not we're going to have a sock puppet replacing uh, Malcolm next week. Um, but certainly we never uh, did anything uh, as, as such as this as putting a ban on people coming onto a program like this and it's a, it's a mistake on the part of the government. And ultimately, it's weak. Um, it, it's weak because all of us in political life will be in some rooms which are hard rooms, some rooms which are easy rooms. But if all you do, it's like what Trisha just said then, is if all you do is choose the room which is easy for you, it ultimately compromises your message. So it's fine for the uh, government ministers to have their weekly spot on Ray Hadley, um, <laughs> but it doesn't actually uh, do a lot to scrutinise the position of the government. And I remember. I remember vividly coming from Victoria, Jeff Kennett, making a decision that he was going to boycott the 7.30 report, um, and that was at the peak of his powers, and everyone thought that you know, he was in a position to do that. But actually it became a symbol of his arrogance, and from that moment forward we saw uh, the decline of the Kennett government. And I think there'll be many uh, government front, MP, front bench MPs who will actually be quite unhappy about this. I mean, uh, the ones I talked to, and prior to coming onto these, uh, onto Q&A, may find this to be a challenging room, but by and large actually enjoy the challenge of, of talking about their position. And I think Tony Abbott uh, seeking to muzzle them in this forum is a huge mistake and one they'll resent. OK, let's stop talking about ourselves. The next question is a video. It's from uh, Lorcan Higgins in Varsity Lakes, Queensland. Following the launch of the Australian Border Force, it is evident that the Coalition have a strong, unified stance on illegal maritime arrivals. Contrastingly, Mr Shorten and the ALP have yet to provide a sufficient response on this pertinent matter. Will this make or break the ALP's campaign in the next election? Richard Miles. Thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> look, uh, let me be very clear at the outset that what uh, a future Labor government will not do is reopen the journey between Java and Christmas Island. We'll be completely clear about that. Because given what we now know, for a future Labor government, or for that matter any government, to reopen this journey, which in you know, the last term saw something like 1,200 people lose their life at sea, for anyone to do that uh, would see that government be condemned by history. Because ultimately what it means is putting back into business people smugglers who right now by and large out of business, who are preying upon and in the process uh, reaping huge profits, preying upon the most vulnerable people there are in the world in a way which saw hundreds of people lose their lives. So we are not about to reopen that journey. I think. Okay, we well, that just in clear. terms of the of reopening or not reopening the journey, as you put it, um, in sort of soft language, Joel Fitzgibbon uh, used harder language. He said the boat turn back policy is one of the tools to stop the flow of asylum seekers. He believes turn backs will remain, as he says, remain. Never been part of. Uh, Labor policy, but that's what he says, remain part of Labor policy, which I suspect he means that you're going to be writing the policy uh, that, that the next Labor government will actually do boat turnbacks in the same way. Is that true or not? Uh, well, uh, come back to the point. We're not about to reopen this journey. We're not about to do anything which makes that happen. In, in terms of uh, turnbacks, actually, you know, there have been points in the past where uh, in the 2007 election, Labor did take a position supporting turnbacks to that election. 
Well, we've articulated concerns around the question of turnbacks, and, and I retain those concerns. And they are basically uh, about its impact on our relationship with Indonesia. I mean, if we're to have an enduring solution to this issue, not about last year and this, but about this decade and next, we need to be working hand in glove with the country from which these vessels are coming. Sure, but and, let, you know, let, well, let, let me put the obvious question. If Indonesia says, no, you can't do it, we don't want you to do it, will a Labor government, future Labor government, say, no, we won't do it, or will it take the same view as this present government uh, that it needs to be done and it will do it? Well, um, it, it, you invite me to go down a hypothetical there. And no, it's I'm just asking well, for a straight it, answer well, it's, as it, to whether you'll consider the same policy that this government has. Uh, it, it, it is impossible to go down that path um, without access to you know, all the cables that exist between Australia and Indonesia, which is fundamentally where our relationship with Indonesia lives. And, and at the end of the day, I come back to the point that this government has been woeful um, in answering questions around this point. They have conducted this area of policy under a shroud of secrecy, such that we saw an incident uh, a few weeks ago where allegedly, and the, the Prime Minister has essentially invited us to believe it happened, uh, money was paid to people smugglers in order to turn a boat around. And here we are weeks later without an answer to that question. But I, I still don't have an answer to the question that I just posed to you, <laughs> well, to be perfectly it, it, honest. It really is a very simple one. If the Indonesian government says, no, we don't want you to do that, will you not do it? Or will well, you take the view that the Abbott government has taken, this is fundamental to our national security and therefore we will do it, whether Indonesia wants it or not? Yeah, look, I, I've, I've articulated our concern. No, you in, haven't. In, well, I have in relation to the question around uh, turnbacks. But, um, and, and, and I make the point, I'm not privy uh, to all the cable traffic which happens between us but and But you're Indonesia. going to be writing the policy yeah, that uh, goes sure. to the ALP so, conference so the point um, that, next month. So the point that I'm making... Or which later is, this we, month. The point that I'm making, which is the principal point that we can can absolutely make and you can draw whatever conclusions you want from this. We will not be reopening the journey between Java and Christmas Island because to do that, in my view, would be profoundly immoral. And are you prepared it, to turn back well, boats I, I, if that's I, I, what it I know you want, I know you want to be focused on that. At the end of the day, we are not That's where going the to... whole debate in no, the ALP well, actually, conference will uh, focus. Yeah, at the end of the day, it, it, it's not about uh, particular uh, issues or, or slogans in relation <laughs> to that. The, the principle here is we are not about to reopen this journey um, because to do so would be profoundly immoral. Was Joel, Fitz, actually, was Joel and, Fitzgibbon right or wrong when I, he said that both well, turned back are you, a possibility? You, you wanted to have a few goes at it. I mean, I, I've articulated our concern in relation to turnbacks. We've asked those questions of the government. We've not heard responses to them. Um, and in the absence of that, uh, you know, I'm not about to walk down a path of either preempting what happens at national conference or answering hypotheticals. But we are not about to reopen this journey, and people should be very clear about Marissa that. Marissa Waters. Um, thanks, Tony. Uh, well, for a start, look, and thank you for your question. Um, I will never agree to refer to asylum seekers and refugees as um, uh, illegal maritime arrivals. It is not illegal to seek asylum, so first things first. Um, secondly, I think... Thank you. Secondly, I, I think that's a, a disappointing response from the Shadow Minister, and I... My heart breaks that we don't see more of a difference between uh, the two big parties on this issue that goes to our very humanity. And um, I certainly hope that at your national conference, um, Mr Miles, that Labor takes the decision to distance itself from the cruelty of the Abbott government's regime. I think Australians are desperately crying out for an alternative that respects the human rights of all people, that respects <coughs> our international obligations that we have not just under human rights conventions, but also under conventions that apply to how we deal with vessels on the sea. And I think if you think that you're somehow saving lives by um, turning back boats, then you're kidding yourself. You're simply um, abandoning those people to, to die elsewhere and to no, continue well, persecution. Um, I, I think this is a really important conversation and I'm pleased that um, people have strong views. But again, I think people are looking for an alternative to the cruelty of the Abbott regime. And when we have solutions like properly working with our regional neighbours and resourcing those UNHCR processing centres so that people don't have that incentive to get on a boat because they're not facing 20 years in limbo in those processing centres where they can't work, they can't send their kids to school and they've got no ent entitlement to healthcare. If we can find the generosity in our hearts to properly fund those processing centres, then you take away the incentive for people to get on a boat. But we should not be turning back boats on the high okay, seas. OK, I want to hear from uh, Greg Sheridan on this. 
Well, look, Tony, a few things. First of all, I think you've got to acknowledge that this is an area of tremendous success for the Abbott government. Uh, Richard and a lot of others said boat turnbacks could never be done and would never work. The Abbott government has imposed its will here and it's been successful. 1,200 people died under the alternative policies. Nobody has died under Operation Sovereign Borders. Where I think Richard, where I think Richard is a bit weak, though, is that... I do believe the compassionate argument of preventing deaths is the overwhelming argument. But you also have to make an argument in principle about the right of Australia to determine who comes to the country and under what circumstances. It was Bob Carr, hardly a lunatic right-winger, who said that the Iranians coming were predominantly not genuine refugees. They were coming from the dominant religious group. They were middle-class people. They were successful. Now, here's a prediction I'll make for you. There will be a ding-dong battle about this at the Labor Party National Conference and there'll be a winner and a loser. And if the policy is permissive and allows Bill Shorten and Richard Miles to go to the election saying we'll do turnbacks where it's safe and we can, they'll never get Indonesian government agreement to do it. So if they say they're going to do it, that means in the face of Indonesian government opposition. If, this, if Richard Miles and Bill Shorten are successful, then they'll make a big step towards being credible but they haven't answered the, the whole problem of their record. But if the left is successful, I think that alone will rule out Labor winning the next election. OK, we've got another question. It's related to this. It's a slightly different question. It's from uh, uh, Tamishka De Silva. Thank you, Tony. The new Border Force Act, which was implemented last week, could see detention centre employees facing two years of jail time for reporting on the conditions faced by immigration detainees. As a future doctor, I will be bound by ethical and professional obligations to the safety of my patients, whether that be in a hospital, in a private clinic or in a detention centre. Why does the Australian government threaten to punish us for speaking up and advocating for basic human rights whilst maintaining a veil of secrecy about its treatment of immigration detainees? OK, I'm going to start with Russ. I think Barnaby Joy should have been here to answer this question, not me. But I think it's a, a matter, I, be, I believe, and with due respect to uh, both uh, our speakers before, I think it's a matter of, of profound cruelty that what happens here, of misjudgment and mismanagement of our human resources. I just came back from Greece, if I may say, and every day we, they received in Greece and Italy 4,000 refugees on a daily basis. And this is not the political issue that I just heard here, and it becomes a matter of the party politics, which I think dehumanizes, demonizes, and essentially creates an imaginary enemy that these people are here to invade the country. We need, they need our help. They need our support. And instead of helping them, we demonise them and we create, as you said, all these mechanisms of control that essentially demonise the people who try to protect them as well. It is, we are rational humanists. If this, this country is based on both rationalism and humanism, at the moment we lose both of them, we become ourselves quite the opposite. We become the terrorists of humanity. And I think this is a serious error of judgement, error of judgement and miss understanding of reality, misprision, I would say that in um, academic terms, that probably the, uh, both governments, since you mentioned my friend Bob Carr as well, at a certain <laughs> stage, uh, they will uh, uh, be, be uh, held accounted for because I think they both made serious errors in this respect. These people are not enemies. They are not invaders. They are desperate people who need help. And unfortunately, we persecute them and prosecute the people who help them. And Greg Sheridan, I'll get you to. Um... <laughs> Greg, I'll get you to respond to the uh, question, which is about the secrecy and the potential jail sentences on uh, doctors and others who are working uh, with asylum seekers in offshore detention. Uh, Tamishka, is that the name? Yeah. yeah. Look, I completely agree with the thrust of that question. I think this is. And a serious overreach by the government. I don't know why it keeps doing this. It keeps... I remember on this program discussing the special intelligence operation legislation, which threatens to jail journalists. For t I mean, who would want to put a journalist in jail, for goodness sake? <laughs> and, then, and the government keeps doing this. It keeps having legislation which will jail certain categories of people, including, in this case, uh, doctors and nurses at detention centres. Now, I, I accept a general obligation of... Um, confidentiality and respect for patients' privacy and all that sort of thing. But 
The government says the purpose of this legislation is to prevent operational information about customs smuggling and, and terrorism and so on. There is no problem with doctors leaking information to, to customs smugglers and terrorists. If there becomes a problem, then pass some legislation. But why put doctors in, in, the, in the gun and then say, but we would never prosecute doctors? Here's a bit of advice for the government, of which I'm not the enemy. The advice is, if it's not meant to affect journalists, if it's not meant to affect doctors and nurses and health workers, exempt them from the legislation. I, I think this is overreach. I, I understand their concern about security of information, but I think this is foolish overreach. Now, Larissa Waters, I, I don't imagine you thought you would have such um, sort of passionate support coming from uh, Greg on uh, this issue <laughs> no, that uh, no. you do. Um, so briefly, your I response? I welcome it. Well, uh, well said, Greg. And Tamishka, thank you for your question. I wish you the best of luck in your medical studies. And please continue to speak out once you are a qualified doctor because without the brave um, revelations of the doctors that were on Nauru, we would not have known about women trading sexual favours in order to get sanitary pads, um, children being sexually abused. Uh, and these uh, allegations have been sadly proven in various government investigations. We know that there's all sorts of atrocities that are happening in these detention centres. And it is a medical obligation for, for you to speak out in the interests of your patient. I can't believe that the parliament passed laws to criminalise speaking out against such atrocities. And it passed in budget week, of course, and sadly it passed with the support of both of the big parties. Well, actually, we've we... got... I'm going to pause you there because we've got a related video question. It is for the Shadow Immigration Minister, Richard Miles. It comes from uh, Dr Sarah Gelbart and Dr Sean Mitchell in Flemington, Victoria. Our question is for the Shadow Minister for Immigration and Border Protection, Mr Richard Miles. The World Medical Association has this week condemned attempts to silence doctors, stating the Border Force Act is in striking conflict with basic principles of medical ethics and as such has no place in a modern democracy. Did Labor read the Border Force Act and if so, why did you rubber stamp this repressive law that turns advocacy into a criminal offence? Well, firstly, um, we absolutely support transparency and it's absolutely critical that uh, doctors, nurses, lawyers, any contractor in a detention facility speak out when they see that there is something wrong. I mean, that's fundamental. Um, people should understand in relation to the Australian Border Force Act, um, and, and Greg, you might want to know this too, it makes it absolutely plain uh, that the whistleblower protection, which applies across the, the public service, which is the basis upon which people speak out, applies in this situation as well. Now, in answer to that question, that's the very first thing we wanted to know in supporting the Australian Border Force legislation. And I hear what Larissa says in terms of our support. Does it mean for this. a whistleblower well, can go public without threat of prosecution? That's, well, that's what the whistleblower legislation no, absolutely that's does. That's not true, Richard. No, that's wrong. It, what, no, what, protected what, information and a designated person cannot go public in the normal course of things under whistleblower legislation. Whistleblower protection absolutely allows you to go public in circumstance... Well, firstly, if there's an emergency, you can go public straight away. And mm. in circumstances where you see that there is something wrong and you've pursued it through the avenues and you've got no recourse... Ah, yes, if you've done yeah, all that and, first. And, well, yes. you're able to make it public. And that's, what's, and that's what's important here. And can I say, there was a Senate inquiry into this in which we sought to examine exactly this and assurances were given uh, during the Senate testimony on that and the unanimous report of the Senate uh, absolutely said that all those protections were in place and an author of that report was Sarah Hanson-Young. I mean, she was an so author that of that report. report. No, there was no dissenting report. There was a unanimous report on that in which Sarah Hanson-Young was absolutely a signatory. And now what you see uh, is a very easy road for the Greens and others to go down. I mean, it, it, it was on the basis of that, in an the answer to this question, that we supported the Australian Border Force legislation. But let's be clear. Doctors, nurses, everyone should speak out if there is something wrong and they see something wrong. And the silence from the government in relation to this has been an absolute disgrace since the moment that this was, brought, this was raised. If there is any doubt at it, about it at all, we ought to have the government out there straight away expressing their support for the right of people to speak out. But instead what you've got is complete silence on their part and it's appalling. Now the government, in fairness, the government has expressed their right. But, I, you know, as someone who doesn't hate the government, I'm not satisfied if the legislature 
legislation says you can go to jail for two years for breaching protected information, the Whistleblower Act does not allow you to breach that information publicly, and I'm not satisfied that that draconian penalty but should be in the legislation against doctors and nurses and health workers. If it's never going to apply to them, exempt them from the, the legislation. The whistleblower protections apply to people who are in customs, always have, um, and apply to people who are now... They don't let you go public. They, they absolutely let you go public. No, in you're the, wrong well, they do. And, and, and this was exactly... Can I just ask a quick question on this? Um, if you attempt to take your complaint through official channels... Um, and you get the answer, you can't go public on this because these are effectively on-water matters or, or in-detention camp matters. Um, what's your next recourse? Can you then go to a journalist and tell them no, what's happening? If you, if Without you have, fear of prison? That is absolutely right. Um, and that's our understanding. But let's be... If the, if, I mean, if you want Labor's view on why this... Is it, why is it well, not the no, understanding uh, of all these doctors? Well, uh, well, what we ought to be hearing from the government right now um, is them answering the concerns of the doctors and coming out and, and standing up for people's right to speak out. And I think that's ultimately the point that we land on here. That's what we think should happen. The government's silence on this has been hopeless, as it has been on a whole lot of areas in relation to this area of policy. Um, and there is no question um, that if doctors see something wrong, they ought to be able to speak up and they ought to be able to do that fear of, without any fear of prosecution. Okay, the and the government orders. should give confirmation. Do you understand that to be the case? Well, look, I think the very existence of uncertainty here at the interaction of two different laws will have a chilling effect on people's confidence in speaking out. If people think they might face two years in jail, they're not going to um, get extended legal advice. They just want to know that they can speak out and reveal... Um, children being sexually abused, um, people being maltreated. Doctors shouldn't have to call their lawyers first if they witness that sort of treatment. So this has a chilling effect. Um, it's exactly why we moved amendments to um, actually allow the media, the Commonwealth Ombudsman, some sort of oversight for these detention centre facilities so that you're not simply putting all of the onus on health workers, other workers in those facilities. We need some transparency and scrutiny here and I do agree with you, Richard, that the government has utterly resisted that to date and it's to great shame. Um, Australian taxpayer dollars are being spent on keeping these facilities open. The atrocities that are perpetrated in those facilities, people have a right to know. And I think if we knew more about what was going on inside them, people would be horrified and they would say, that's not the Australian way. And, uh, well, it's not, right, it's well, not right to gang up on the government the here. There. Just read the legislation. The legislation says if, you're, if it's protected information and you're a designated person, you can't uh, reveal that information. That is not overridden by whistleblower it protection. Is it is absolutely not. By the it is the same obligation the that goes to federal police the people. It's the same obligation that goes to ASIO people and it is very explicitly is not, not overridden. Same obligation that by, goes it to is. ASIO. The it government isn't. is briefing notes. I don't know if you've read the re legislation, Richard, but it is very clear <laughs> that whistleblower legislation does not allow you to go to a journalist. Well, and I'm not even saying people should necessarily be allowed to go to a journalist, but they shouldn't face two years in jail well, for well, doing it's so. A, it's just wrong. It, was de it, w it went through the Senate inquiry. It was debated at length. There is a unanimous Senate report, which, as I say, has Sarah Hansen's young signature on it. Um, we wrote to the government asking exactly these questions. I have a letter from the minister giving precisely the assurances that you're now saying is not right. It's um, not so, in the legislation, so it's not, Richard. It's, You've just it, got to read the legislation. Yeah, and the legislation makes it clear that it is to be read in terms, of, you know, subject to all the all the other federal legislation which exists, which the Public Interest Disclosure Act is one. But listen. It shouldn't be me who's coming out here and defending this. We ought to be hearing from the government. If you're a doctor, that's who you actually want to hear from. There's, I mean, but, but, but you're basically is saying, right. again, can I just, uh, we, we you're basically saying that the government got this right. Oh, what I'm saying is that, that the government has a role to be out there and giving clarity and certainty. But you're saying doctors. that the government got this right, that well, the actually, legislation is appropriate, I, and that you have all the. I, I do actually think. You want. I, I do actually think that the doctors have got it wrong here. That's my understanding. Okay. And I, so I'm, the I'm, government's got it right? Well, uh, uh, maybe, <laughs> but the point is that we ought to hear the government out there now uh, giving a sense of security to everybody that they have a right to but speak isn't that, out. Isn't and, that what you're doing on their behalf? Oh, and what, uh, which, which is not good enough. It'd be much better okay, if the right. government were here okay, doing it right. or elsewhere. Uh, yes, all right, so we've got to go to another question, I'm told. Um, uh, it's from Louisa Valpel. Yeah, my question was originally for Barnaby Joyce, Minister for Agriculture. I think it's a shame he's not here to answer it, but I'll put it to the panel because I think we urgently need to talk about the future of Australia's food security and agriculture. 
Um, I worked as a Jillaroo for two mustering seasons on a uh, on Glengyle Cattle Station in Western Queensland, which is a uh, property of the Kidman, Kidman & Co. And Kidman is one of Australia's largest beef producers. It's got um, with 100,000 square kilometres, that's three quarters of the size of England, almost 2% of the land mass of the Australian continent. And for the first time ever, this farmland is up for sale um, for just $325 million. Um, and interested bidders include state-owned enterprises from the US, South America, Indonesia and China. And my question is, should foreign state-owned enterprises uh, be allowed to buy up Australian farmland? Tricia, we'll start with you. My view is that I'm basically in favour of foreign investment. My understanding, although I don't understand agriculture very well, is that the sector is in dire need of fresh capital. I'm open to suggestions that it may be very much contrary to the national interest, particularly in terms of national security, to uh, basically refuse an offer for a foreign state-owned enterprise to invest in agricultural property in Australia. But so far, I haven't really heard that case being made. And so I am inclined to perhaps not share your concerns. At Larissa Waters, should uh, foreign state-owned enterprises be allowed to buy up Australian farmland? Well, thank you, Louisa, for your question and well done on working the land as a young woman. It'd be nice to see more young women following in your footsteps. Um, this is a vexed issue because um, with the white paper being released today, foreign ownership is a key issue and um, the Foreign Investment Review Board have quite a high threshold for when they review what's considered in the national interest when there's a proposal for purchase by a foreign entity. When it comes to state-owned enterprises, it's a bit of a different kettle of fish and the Greens believe that we should not be selling um, Australian land, food producing land in particular, in this age of um, food insecurity given the changing climate, uh, to state-owned um, outfits. So lower the firm threshold for foreign investment, yes, and apply that national interest test, but um, I think for state-owned uh, entities, then the sale of food producing land. It, look, food security is going to become increasingly problematic as the climate continues to change, which is why it's such a shame that that agriculture white paper released um, just earlier today, uh, the fact that it's got five paragraphs on climate change towards the end of the book, what a tragic missed opportunity. It's well, Barnaby Joyce, if he's not here to make this point, but I'm no doubt he would, that there are <laughs> elements of climate change action right through the entire report. That's his well, I argument. Wish, well, I wish that were the case. It's not certainly not seen any evidence of that. The other issue I want to raise in relation to food security is the fact that coal seam gas and coal mines can currently go onto our best food producing land and landholders don't have the right to say no. They don't have the right to safeguard their aquifers. And uh, I think that's a real shame and I've had legislation stick with the in the Senate to try was, uh, to rectify asked here, that. And I'll go no to uh, Greg so Sheridan uh, to hear from you. Uh, look, this is a difficult question full of contradictory impulses. I am very uneasy about state-owned enterprises buying agricultural land. Uh, the Prime Minister once said we don't believe in socialism when it's an Australian government owning Australian enterprises. Why would we want foreign governments to own Australian enterprises? On the other hand, and there's also a big danger in convincing foreign governments that in order to trade with us they need to own our assets, whereas it's much better if they just buy the things that we produce in a good market. On the other hand, we've kind of buggered ourselves up pretty badly in this country. We've made our cost structures terrible. We've uh, put massive disincentives in the way of domestic investment. And, you know, a system finds a way of coping with that. And one way the system copes with our terrible, insane cost structures is by sort of subleasing enterprise to, to foreign entities. Uh, we went through in the resources boom a period where we kind of became Saudi Australia. We paid ourselves more than we were, than we were really earning and we didn't like to do dirty, difficult, dangerous and demanding work. And I, I think we need to get back to developing our own agricultural land. But I'm very uneasy about state-owned enterprises uh, uh, owning Australian land. Ross, what do you think? May I say that I agree with what's said because... But we live, we live in a period of globalisation. 
And what we need from government is to regulate these markets, especially if it's state-owned and want to buy something in Australia. But at the same time, I believe that we have to open up this economy because we can't have inward-looking economies because essentially they're self-consuming passions at the end. And it's not enough anymore to feed the population as diverse as the Australian one simply with what is produced here. We are a consumer society. We have so many needs from all over the world. We have so many communities from all over the world. So multiculturalism becomes something very important in the whole mixture here. But I think what we need is a government will be able to regulate this market instead of regulating the secrecy about the refugees. <laughs> and you have to pay more attention in this regulation of the market instead of looking how to impose more sort of a secretive legislation about the, on these cases. You've, you've slipped off the topic and I'll go to yeah. Richard Miles <laughs> to get back onto it. <laughs> yeah, um, Look, we, we, agriculture represents one of the enormous opportunities for the Australian economy going forward, being a food bowl for uh, the growth of the middle class in, in Asia, particularly uh, in China, is going to be a huge source of uh, production and employment in Australia going forward. But to make that happen, we're going to need foreign investment. Um, some of that's going to come from state-owned enterprises. Now, at the moment, uh, if you are a state-owned enterprise, you need to go through the Foreign Investment Review Board. Invariably, uh, you get approval for that. Um, and I think that's appropriate. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm uh, for us to go out there and be trying to put more restrictions on foreign investment in Australia, I think is a huge mistake. It is actually going to stifle the growth of what is one of the most important uh, production parts of our economy going forward. And can I say this government uh, has been completely hopeless uh, when it comes to its regime around foreign investment. Rather than encouraging it, it has been discouraging it, which is remarkable uh, from what is meant to be a conservative government. Uh, and it flies in the face of what's our economic <coughs> opportunity in the future. OK, well, it's been a great discussion. We're just about to run out of time. Our last question is on politics. It comes from Xanthi uh, Kuvatis. Um, with record low levels of approval for both the Prime Minister and the Opposition Leader, there is clearly a lack of trust and disdain towards leadership in politics today. What will or should the major parties do to address this and fix their respective broken systems? Trisha Jean. I think developing some consistent principles would be a good start. Um, I, think, I think the asylum seeker policy is actually the asylum seeker debate is actually a very good example of this in the sense that there's so little debate being had. I mean, it's one of the... The Border Force Act, in my view, is one of the nastier bits of bipartisanship that we've seen. But I think, what, quite opposed to what some people may think, I think the bigger problem with our political system is that fewer politicians are willing to say, this is what I believe and I'm going to stick to my guns on this and accept that, you know, ideological differences are real and they're important. Like, you are selling a message to the Australian population. I mean, Australian voters have values, they have, they have things they care about and political parties <coughs> should reflect this rather than some weird convergence that we have currently. And I think that is what is driving that kind of lacklustre leadership and political um, acumen that we're seeing generally. So are you saying, you, you're saying that both sides lack principle, is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, I am. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, Craig Sheridan. Well, look, uh, Tony, I'd say to you honestly, I think both Tony Abbott and Bill Shorten are very good blokes and they get a much bummer rap than they deserve. I think this latest series of attacks on Bill Shorten for being a moderate union leader mm -hmm are just barking mad. What do we want him to be, a, a mad, militant, crazy union leader? And I think... So, I mean, just, just on that score, uh, briefly, because we know that uh, later this week he'll be appearing before a, a Royal Commission. I think it's supposedly going to be $80 million spent on that Royal Commission. Do you think that is a bridge too far? Do you think that is a political Royal Commission, no, as think... Labor is alleging? No, I think there are irregularities in the union movement, but they're not in the part of the union movement that Shorten was in. And I think there's a case for better regulation about corporate union financial transactions. But one reason we're a better country than we might be is because we have a large slab of the union movement which has decent political values and wants its enterprises to succeed the transport workers, the AWU, the shop assistants um, and a number of others. But, uh, but to answer your question directly, I think the whole, you know, without becoming too sort of uh, grandiose about this, the whole of Western society is going through a crisis of belief and confidence in its own institutions. And I think we're far too cynical about our politicians. 
I haven't met an Australian politician who didn't go into the business to try to make life better for their fellow Australians. And I think we're, we're far too um, negative about them and we penalise them too much for, for trivial things. This attack on Bill Shorten reminds me of the insane attacks on Tony Abbott for allegedly not being a nice person when he was at university. There's a sort of grotesqueness to our public discourse now which is trivial and cynical and nasty. And I think the politicians are more victims of it than progenitors. We've got very little time left. Um, you've just come from the home of democracy. A brief answer from you. I think in Australia we have policies but not politics. <laughs> and that is due to the fact that prop politics, the politicians have become a profession of their own, totally autonomous to a certain degree, without organic connection with the society. Sometimes they become symptoms of the diseases of the society, instead parts of the solution for the diseases of the society. And unfortunately, coming from the, the, um, the best place of democracy, populism in most occasions becomes the worst policy in that respect and lack, as we said before, Patricia, of vision for the future. Where we want to go from now, that's the important thing. Instead of dealing with trivial issues, with symptoms of the disease instead of the disease itself. Um, we've got time for brief answers from our last two guests. Uh, Larissa. Uh, thank you, Xanthi. Excellent question. Um, and I guess, like Greg, we're all just human. We do the best we can. But I know what I respond to is conviction and a long-term vision. And I'd love to see more of that being expressed in the parliament. You see, so often it's about point scoring off the other person off the 24-hour media cycle. And I think that really debases what could be a very noble um, and aspirational body that is our parliament. So I'd like to see some more conviction, a bit more courage. And I think part of that is getting rid of the influence of vested interests through their donations on our political system. OK, we're, we're just about out of time. A brief answer, very brief. Uh, well, uh, Tony, an $80 million smear campaign on your political opponent is certainly a bridge too far, and that's what this Royal Commission is. But um, in, in answer to the question, I, I think... Uh, We've got to be less worried about opinion polls and we need to be prepared to put forward uh, visions which may, in fact, uh, deliver some difficult news but necessary news. And that's what, the way we're going about things. That's why I've suggested a whole lot of proposals which are uh, in relation to reducing the tax concessions on super, which are difficult. You meet criticism, it's not popular, but we actually believe that if you walk forward and you present an outline to people, you will ultimately get a result. And that is all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Greg Sheridan, uh, Vrasidas uh, Karalis, Larissa Waters, Richard Miles and Tricia Jar. <laughs> now, next Monday on Q&A, we're expecting the Minister for Communications, Malcolm Turnbull, Shadow Assistant Minister for Education, Amanda Rishworth, Canadian theological historian and philosopher John Stackhouse, Australian war correspondent uh, Michael Ware, whose new documentary chronicles the birth of ISIS, and the director of polling at the Lowy Institute for International Policy, Alex Oliver. Just before we go, uh, our thanks to BuzzFeed Australia for pointing out the many, many things that didn't last as long as Quandagate, including the Apollo 11 space mission, the Cuban missile crisis, which brought us to the brink of annihilation, but only ran for 13 days, and Mal Meninga's political career, which only lasted 27 <laughs> seconds. Until next week's Q&A, good night. Uh, uh, uh.